first of all, this text has in it the prohibition of sinner. It has a great placard displayed at the gates of heaven. And the list, the dark catalog, is spelled out in all the stern language of the Holy Ghost. The unrighteous cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And for a little time tonight, I want to dwell upon this awful truth. I want to dwell upon this truth that needs to be proclaimed up and down the land with trumpet blast. Sinners prohibited from heaven. I want you to think about that. It's so contrary to the type of gospel, the sort of popular gospel that's preached today. Secondly, I want you to know there's another great truth that lie on the surface of my text. We have here the identification of ourselves. Look at it. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. The identification of ourselves. And then last of all, we have the wonder. And what a wonder it is. We have the transformation of God's salvation. See this hideous, wretched, diabolical crew that have raked in the kettles of hell and soiled their soul with steams that are damnable and evil. Such were some of you, but ye are washed. Thank God for that washing. Thank God for that washing. And you will notice that here we have a sanctification before a justification. The theologian would tell us justification comes first. And then sanctification. But here we have a sanctification put before justification. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. I tell you there are, there is separating power in the blood of the Lamb. And the Lamb that's washed in the Savior's blood, he's a sanctified soul. There is the stamp of God's separation of us. It took seven dips in Jordan Stream to take away the leprosy of Naaman the Syrian. But one plunge in the blood stream of Calvary, and a sinner loses all his guilty stains. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified. Not a word about the church in this text. Don't you notice that? Not a word about church membership here. Not a word about baptism here. Isn't it amazing? Look at it carefully. What does it say? But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the church. No, sir. In the name of the Lord Jesus, worthy is the Lamb to take all the praise and all the glory. And by, don't miss this part, by the Spirit of our God. So I want to talk a little about the transformation of salvation. Let's look first of all at the prohibition of sinners. 
from many pulpits today where the claim is made that they are evangelical and sound on the fundamentals. There is an attempt to weaken the justice of Almighty God. Some preachers seem to take it as their business to pare down the sharp point of God's inflexible justice in some way to minimize the attribute of the God of truth and the God of holiness and the God of righteousness. And there seems to be an attempt to tell us that the mercy of Almighty God in some way works against the justice of God, and that God is so full of mercy that judgment will not be poured out on the head of sinners. I want to announce to you tonight that the sinner who does not leave his sin, forsake his sin, repent of his sin, Turn his back to the sin forever and have the mercy of Almighty God. There's no mercy for you if you're going to hold on to your sin. Sin and you cannot walk the way to heaven. Sin and you in harmony will walk the road to hell. And that's the only road that you can travel if you're in partnership with sin. Let me repeat it. There's a prohibition, a prohibition at yonder gate of heaven. I stand at the gate of heaven, and from the church pew a soul comes who has broken and violated the law of God and is a fornicator. And in this permissive societies, how many fornicators occupy church pews today? I and occupy church pulpits today. And he comes to the gate of heaven. But there is no entrance to the fornicator there. And if, my friend, you have violated God's law, and if you have given your body over to lust, heaven's door is barred against you as long as you cling to that lust and hold on to that sin. There's only one place in eternity for a fornicator, and that's hell and the place of the damned and the perdition of the pit. He can plead his baptism. He can plead his church membership. He can plead his works of charity. He can plead everything that would make him respectable in the church that he attended and in the society in which he moved. But God Almighty says, Hear it tonight, know ye not, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Banned from heaven, doomed to hell, the unalterable law of God, the unchangeable law of the immutable Jehovah, says to hell, you must go, you fornicator. And to hell, the fornicator certainly will go. I want to tell you, friend, we need to restore to our pulpits the preaching of God's righteousness. How men have pulled down the standard of Almighty God. They tell us this is a different age from the age of the apostles. They tell us we should join the progressive movement in the thinking of the church. They tell us man is evolving. The progress is on. 
when I look out of the world, I see it's only progress. It's a retrogression that takes men to hell. And the world is dark tonight. Where are the preachers of righteousness? Do you remember old Noah? He was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't busy standing with a calculator, totting up statistics. He was a preacher of righteousness. And I tell you what we need today are men that can preach righteousness. Cry out against him. He didn't have too many converts here. But he got his family sealed. A preacher that can see his family one for God. He can thank God for a wonderful ministry. There's something worse than an empty church. It's an offended God. And I would rather have the blessing of God and empty seats than have a full church built on compromise and surrender of God's eternal truth. Let's go down the line. Let's call the names of these sinners. We're told you shouldn't name sin today. You should deal with it in a general way. That this is not the day to pick out specific sins and name them and deal with them. By God, the Holy Ghost deals with them. The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. Oh, for preachers that will preach with this apostolic language, that will not spare sin, where it raises its ugly head in the community, whether it be in the palace or the hovel, whether it be in church or in state, whether it be popular so to do, or brings upon the head of the preacher vile persecution. It is my business as a gospel preacher to be strong in the denunciation of sin, to cry out against it, in the name of my God. And if I feel to cry out against it, then my ministry has failed. No matter what popular acclaim may be accorded to me in the way. What does it say? It says here, idolater. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. What? Does God visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children? Yes, sir! And is it because of our father's sins that this generation is feeling the judgment of God? Yes, sir! But thank God, he shows mercy upon thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Are you an idolater? Do you belong to a church that's filled with idolatry? And let me tell you, the ecumenical movement is taking the Protestant churches right into idolatry. It's the idolatrous road that the ecumenical movement is going. And I saw recently that the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Ramsey, he said to the Pope, we would welcome you as the new head of the world church. But we can't swallow your infallibility. And the Pope said, you either have me infallible or you don't have me at all. And of course, the ecumenical movement 
will soon develop the big swallow. And they'll swallow Papa and all. Infallibility and all. They have swallowed so much. Yes. They have swallowed so much. Just another gulp. And Popery will be done. And the world church will come about. I'm glad I have neither part nor lot in it. I thank God every day that not a brick in my church belongs to the ecumenical movement. I wouldn't even give them the cobwebs that the spiders weave upon those bricks. Thank God to be outside the downgrade. If you have eyes to see and you read the book of Revelation, you would soon know that the woman will ride upon the beast. The ecumenical woman astride the beast, riding the beast. Do we not see it today? Idolatry. Of course, there are idolaters in Orthodox Protestant churches. There are people who put things before their God. There are those who bow to position, to wealth, to business. To company, to education, instead of bowing to God Himself. Is God supreme in your life? Have you any other gods before Him? What about your time? What about your tithe? What about your offering? What about your service? Come on now. Be us up to it. No idolater can get into heaven. Look at it again. Oh, it spells it out, nor adulterers. In my country, they're trying to sponsor a bill to make divorce as easy as possible. The Bible has some strong things to say on this. The Bible tells me that divorce can only be based on one thing, the infidelity of one of the partners to the marriage. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus said, remember, if there's a putting away that violates this commandment, the person's guilty, become a daughter. Now the law can do what it likes, but it cannot change the law of Almighty God. I know it's not popular to say anything like that. They tell me I shouldn't say that. I'll say it in Parliament very shortly. Oh, I tell you, friend, no act of some legislative body can change the law of Almighty God. What God says is true. And I tell you, man and woman, you can't have revival and break and violate God's law. And God says, no adulterer will get into heaven. And it's God that tells you what an adulterer is, not me or any fundamentalist preacher. You say, preacher, this is terrible preaching. I tell you, the law of God's a terrible thing. And until you get a vision of the heinousness and heinousness of your own heart, You'll never get a vision of the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Until we diagnose sin and point out how evil it is. Nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Homosexuality and all the other perversions of lust. What do I find? I find evangelical people and some fundamentalist people are soft on these issues. You see, you've got to understand. You don't appreciate. I can't appreciate what God has done from heaven. Not called upon to do that. And we have today, instead of calling it sin, they call it sickness. Say these people are sick. I want to tell you it's the sickness of hell. And it's sin. Spell it out. Oh, for a race of those old evangelists 
who stood under canvas roofs like this. And I tell you, when they preached, they preached against him. I remember as a boy sitting in many a tent campaign conducted by my godly father. And as I heard him preach of the sweat ran down his face, I trembled when I thought of what sin was and what sin does. May God send us a bunch of Holy Ghost preachers that will preach against the sins of today. And any church that's weak on these things has sold the past, pulled down the standard, and compromised its soul for the popular acclaim of an easy-going age. There can be no justification for such sins, nor fees. This is an age of thievery. It's an age when people seem to think it's the right thing to do to take anything you want. And you don't need to bother paying for it. We have some people in our country, some churches in our country, and they amass tremendous bills, and they don't seem to pay. And some of the preachers, one of them said to me once, Oh, I'm praying for a quick rapture. And oh, we'll all be away, and then I'll not have to pay my bills. I want to tell you that language is blasphemy against Almighty God. Thievery in the church. Thievery among the professed people of God. What must it be like out in the world? I was talking to a big employer of labor recently. And you know what he said to me? He said, it's hard, Ian, to get an honest employee today. They either thieve your time and don't work the hours, or they thieve something in the workshop and take it away with them. And he said to me, I would rather have a poor worker and an honest man, but I'm finding them mighty hard to get. That's only one small employer when you think of the employees around the world, thieving. If you take that which doesn't belong to you and you practice that, I don't care what profession your lips make. God says no thief will get into heaven. You can tell me that ten years ago you made a decision. You can tell me that you think you're seeing. I want to tell you the Bible says that thieves are banned from heaven. I know a Christian can fall into sin. But I want to tell you, a Christian repents of a sin, turns to God. And I don't get many backsliders in the Bible, and you read it, that stayed away from God too long when they were backslidden. I want you to know that. Oh, what else does it say? Nor covetous. This is a covetous age, isn't it? And there's covetousness among the people of God. And in some churches in Ulster, we find people covet another man's prosperity. And they're jealous of the man. He does a little well in business. They covet his position. When I see God's people prospering, I rejoice. When I see a preacher going for God, I rejoice. I can't win every soul that's going to be saved. Thank God there's plenty. The devil will still be on the job and millions to be converted. So you'll never run out of a job. So you needn't worry, preacher. And a one fellow's doing better for you than you. I want to tell you, you don't know the burden he's carrying. I had a young fellow walked into my church and he said, My, you have a great congregation. It must be wonderful to be the preacher in such a church. I said, Young man, if you knew the blood and the sweat and the tears and the agony of the preacher's heart and the preacher's life. If you walk the lonely road that I have walked for 30 years in keeping true to the doctrines of the Christian faith and fighting popery and modernism and communism and every otherism that has come through the gratings of hell to curse the world, I said, you would know there's nothing wonderful about it. It's a lonely road. You should pray for men that are in the front line for God. They're under satanic attack. 
He said, I think I understand. I think I would be better with a small church and less responsibility. I said, you're getting the message. You're getting the message. Oh, dear friends, let me tell you, covetousness is a cancer. It's destroyed great churches. It's destroyed great preachers. It's destroyed great ministry. And if it's destroying God's people, it's surely destroying the world. Thou shalt not covet, as the Bible says. And the same commandment that says thou shalt not kill. The same commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. You know what this book says? If you're a coveter, you'll not be in heaven. Prohibition's up. Ban from God's heaven. Covered this sinner, you'll never stand on the gates of gold or pass through the pearl hung gateway to the glory land. You can't be there. Let's look at it again. Nor drunkards. I don't know about your country, but my country is flooded with drunkards today. I never saw more drink consumed in a generation than the generation in which I live. Young people and older people caught in the vice of alcoholism. If ever the Church of Christ needed another Billy Sunday to cry out against the liquor traffic, we need them today. And yet the majority of pulpits are absolutely silent on this thing. And they give no strong testimony and no strong denunciation of this evil thing. The men that make their money and get their blood money from broken homes and broken hearts and damned and ruined souls, they're welcomed in society. Welcome to the offices of the state. Welcome to high office in the church. And the church corrupted and sinful has not a word of rebuke to give them. But I want to tell you, no drunkard can get into heaven. There's someone here tonight, and that's your sin. You keep on at it, and you'll be in hell. It'll be a drunkard's grave, and a drunkard's hell for you. And I can understand. When you see a man in his cup, never laugh at him. Have a broken heart for him. For there goes you, but for the grace. Of Almighty God. You should go and put your arm around him. And you should try to win him to the Savior. For if he goes on in that road, he'll be lost. Irretrievably lost without remedy in a drunkard's hand. Revilers. And then we have reviling the things of God. We have them in the video. We have them in the press. We have them in the TV. We have them in the film. We have them along our street. How often is the name of Jesus revived? The blessed name of the Son of God who died for men. How often today in this town of Greenville, this city of Greenville, his blessed name has been revived. And of course there are those who revile the preachers that preach the word. And those that revile the book, and from our press there pours forth a flood of propaganda against the blessed word of God and against the standards of the book. This is an age when men revile the Son of God and the word of God. But revilers, they may be ecclesiastical revilers. They may hold the highest office in the church. They may have occupied the highest place in human scholarship, but they take their poison pen and their poison lips, and they revile this book, and they revile the Son of God, and they deny His deity and His virgin birth and His sinlessness, and they deny the blood that He shed for the redemption of the world, and they deny His cross work, and they deny His bodily resurrection. They are revilers! 
And there's no place in heaven. They are the agents of the he- of hell. Apostles of the pit. They preach another gospel. They're inspired by another spirit. They present another Jesus. And that gospel is not the gospel of this book. And that spirit is not the spirit of God. And that Jesus is not the Christ of God. And there's something else here. Nor extortioners, blood suckers in business, men that extort for their own evil gain, never get to heaven. You're at that business, friend, I want to tell you, heaven's barred to you. That's a terrible list. It's a terrifying list, isn't it? Need to search our hearts and say, oh God, is there one bit of this sin that I'm holding to my heart? Is there something in this vile catalog that fits me? I never saw it before. I thought that heaven was surely mine. But tonight, no unrighteousness can inherit the kingdom of God. Oh God, am I on this dark list, prohibited from heaven, banned from the celestial city? No entrance at the pearl hung gate. No glory for me throughout eternity. May God search every heart. But there's something else here. There's the identification of ourselves. Look at it. Such were some of you. Now I want to tell you there are people here and they've been saved from their childhood. Thank God for that. I thank God God saved me at the age of six. And God kept me from the grosser sins of this world. But I know that in my corrupted heart is the seed of every one of these sins. And I want to tell you that tonight. And you may never have brought forth the fruit of these sins. But I want to tell you the evil seed is in the depraved heart of men. And there's not one person in this meeting not capable of bringing forth the dark fruit of these sins. Every one of them. Nothing nice about that heart of yours. It's deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? It has a bite at the darkness of hell and the deception of the devil. Dark, black, evil heart. And out of it proceeds evil thought. And in it is the seed of every bone, sin, and perversion that man can think about. That's the sin. That thank God, God has saved his people from. I wonder why. I'll tell you why. Because, thank God, when I run down this list, you know what I say when I read every thing in this catalog? I say, how great is the power of gospel to save from such sin. Can the gospel save a fornicator? Hallelujah! The gospel can save a fornicator. Can the gospel save an idolater, yes, praise the Lord, the gospel can save an idolater. Can the gospel save an adulterer? Yes, the gospel can cleanse the adulterer's soul so that scarlet sins are washed away forever, cleansed through the blood of the Lamb. Can the gospel save a person perverted? That he has turned nature against itself and walked down into that dark valley where it's a shame to speak in public of the things that he has done. Glory to God, this gospel can save that man. The gospel I believe in. Can the gospel of Jesus Christ save a thief? The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. 
And there may I, though vileless be, wash all my sins away. Can the covetous person, the poor drunkard, with the muddled mind, and with a thirst for booze that will never be satisfied, is there some power that can take those chains that hell has forged and smash them to pieces on the roadway and set that man free? Bless God there is in the gospel of the grace of Almighty God. When I go down that list, I say, what a gospel. It's a gospel of power. I say, what a gospel of infinite mercy. That God would devise means whereby these black, banished souls be not always expelled for hell. And mercy takes her flight from heaven. And with the swiftness of the cherubim wings arrives down in the pit of iniquity and searches out a poor, lost, vile, guilty sinner and touches that sinner with supernatural grace. And thank God that sinner turns, turns away from sin. And the sin that he once loved he learns by the Holy Ghost to hate. And the things that he once hated, he learns by the same Spirit to love. And he's changed. He's transformed. Something happens that the church couldn't do, that baptism couldn't do, that profession couldn't do. What is it? It's the salvation of Almighty God. When I read this list of sin, I say, how is mercy? Magnified. And then I say, how is self-righteousness confounded? Oh, there's no self-righteous rag sinner will get to heaven. God hates man's righteousness. God hates self-righteousness. God hates religious righteousness. You know what he says? He says, all your righteousness, plural, he didn't say all your sins. He says, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags in my sight. So, if I do not get a righteousness that is divine, I'm lost forever. Is there some garment so beautiful, so immaculate, so clean, that when it covers the sinner, it's like the poultice son, Hezekiah's boy. It not only covers the boy, but it cures it. Is there a covering like that for me? Yes, there is a perfect robe wrought in the sinless obedience of the Savior's life. And it's by his blood shedding on the accursed tree. And Christ is made unto us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Sinner friend, put on Jesus Christ tonight. Yes, there's the identification of ourselves. But oh, I must dwell for a moment upon the transformation of salvation. Look at it. Such were some of you, ye Corinthian saints. Your pedigree was vile. Your record was abominable. Your past is black. There's nothing but guilt in every page of your past career. But such were some of you. But ye are washed. Where shall I wash away these vile stains of these damnable sins? At what fountain? Can these sins be eternally erased? Where can I find a solution that can go down into the depths of my corrupted soul and purge me from these vile things? No fount of man 
No liquid of man's device. No solution of man can take away these stains. But here at tonight, men and women, there's a fountain opened up in the house of David for sin. And for all, Mark, for all uncleanness, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. And I tell you, when you're washed in that blood, you know what happens? You're sanctified. What does that mean? You're separated. Separated from those sins. Oh, you indulged in them for years, didn't you? You need a practice of them. But thank God when the blood touches the heart by the Holy Ghost, they're separated. They're gone. Thank God they're gone forever. And the drunkard drinks no more. And the vile man shuns his vileness forever. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, behold, behold it tonight. All things are become new. But ye are just. You know what justification is? The Presbyterian Catechism has the greatest definition of justification. Found it and agreeable to the world. Justification is an act of God's free grace. Wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in him. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. By simple faith, his righteousness is mine. And God, as the eternal judge, makes a decision. And he reckons his righteousness to be mine. And my sin to be his. And thank God, he then is just, but the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. No court of man could make a sinner, a guilty sinner, just. Oh, he could get a pardon, but he couldn't make him just. But I go out of the judgment hall of God with mercy on one hand and justice on the other. For mercy and peace are met together and righteousness and truth have kissed one another at the cross. Will you come to the cross tonight and be washed and be sanctified? And be justified. May God bring you there in his great and wonderful grace this very night.